This is the first of two lectures on analysis of variance for Chapter 14 for Stats 253. This title, ANOVA, stands for Analysis of Variance, and it is a little bit misleading. The objects that are being analyzed are not variances. Instead, they're the means of various treatment groups in a designed experiment. What this is referring to is, um, for example, you have, an, say, an experiment in which you're looking at the effect of light on plants. So you take all these plants and you divide them into different groups, like 40 plants in each group. The first one gets 5 hours of sunlight, the second gets 12 hours, the next one gets 24, the other one gets 2, etc. Each one of those is called a treatment group. They're all part of the experiment, but there's either different um, something different is being applied to them or different amounts are being applied to them. And those are the treatment groups. So in this example, continuing this example, you would measure the growth of the plants in each group. Say there's 40 in each group. You measure all these, the growth of these plants. Well, that's going to be different. You know, it's going to be some average, some mean associated with it and some standard deviation. So what you're looking at is the means of these various treatment groups and the goal is similar to the goal that we've had in the last several chapters. Is there any significance to differences between the means of these treatment groups? Now where variances come in is um, in the following. I'm going to draw two graphs here. Okay, and let's let um, okay forget that line. So let's say this is one mean, and I'm gonna it's gonna be the same in both cases. And so here's another mean, and these will be means from two treatment groups. If you want to keep thinking of that uh, example I was talking about earlier. Um, you would say, well, maybe this one were the plants that got four hours of sunlight, and these are the plants that got 12 hours of sunlight. Okay, so you see different amounts of growth there. So this is um, the x axis is, uh, well, in this case, it would be growth, but it would be the independent variable, whatever that is. Again, the independent variable. I'm making two graphs in order to make a point here. And okay, these are the means. So this is say mu one, and here's mean two, and this is the second one down here. Let's say they have the same value. Now, the question is, the 12-hour um, plants showed more growth than the four-hour plants. Is it enough to be significant? Right. Would, in general, you're looking at with this analysis of variance is to see if these means are, so to speak, in each other's space. So let's draw in not just the mean here, but the standard deviation for these means. Okay, let's say in this case, the standard deviation is, um, so I'm going to draw more than just the mean here. So let's say it's out like, I'm going to draw it poorly. It's out like this, okay. And this one has a, I'm going to change color here, has a standard deviation, if you want to draw in the whole curve, looks something like that. So you see all this overlap here between these two, and that's not even, a, this isn't even that good of an example. Now, let's look at it down here. And let's say these are very small, small variants or small standard deviations. Okay, so it's like that. And this one, put it in green, is just going to look like this too. Okay. All right. The difference between the means is exactly the same. They have the same difference here. In this case, the difference is more significant. 
and here it is less significant because of you could say the overlap of the normal distribution that would be associated with this mean and that's where the idea of variance comes in not in terms of the standard deviation it's expressed in terms of variance um, but that's basically the idea and this is an introductory course so you're supposed to get ideas more than you're supposed to get derivations so if you can kind of get your mind around that you'll s understand what we're looking at here and of course there's more than two treatments you'll have to look in general over the whole experiment. For this class we're going to look at what's called one-way analysis of variance and that means there will be only one independent variable. For example if you were doing an experiment on blood sugar and you looked at three different medications. Okay, the only variable is medication and you have three different ones or three different treatments for that experiment. Or for example you might be looking at one medication but different dosages. If you have 10 different dosages, then there are 10 different treatments, but only one independent variable. Now you can have more than one independent variable, but that is not one-way analysis of variance. Um, an example would be, say you were looking at two medications, two pills, and two exercise programs. So some people you put on exercise program one and pill number two, others have pill number two, and exercise program number one, and all kind of mixed up combinations like that. In that case, you have two independent variables. One would be the medication, and the other would be the exercise program. That's what we're not going to consider here. We're only going to consider cases of one independent variable. Also, we'll be using balanced experiments in which there's the same number of subjects in each treatment group. That makes some um, some analysis that occurs after the analysis of variance. It makes that analysis easier. Okay, we start with our hypothesis, and again, we're going to have a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. Now, in the past, the null hypothesis was the idea that you had or the measurement that you made prior to even starting the study. It was the status quo, so to speak. Okay, in this case, the null hypothesis is that every one of the means and all the different treatment groups is identical. In other words, all the things that I do to these aren't going to matter. It's not going to be significant, any differences that I see. That is a null hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis is that one of the means, doesn't matter which one, one of them is going to be significantly different from the others. So in other words, we're not starting with some a priori measurement or idea. Instead, we're starting with the idea that all of the means of the treatment groups are going to be, if not identical, very close together. Okay, and the alternative is that one of them is going to be different. At least one. Could be more. So in thinking of the past, uh, for hypothesis testing, we used normal distributions and um, the student T distribution. Here we're going to use what's called the F distribution, which is a combination of chi-squared distributions. It is um, The test will always be uh, one-tailed tests. They're going to be uh, right-tailed tests. And the F di distribution, like the chi-squared distribution, is always positive. I will sort of draw it here for you, although I'm sure you can find better pictures of it than this. Okay, it looks something like this. It's big up here and it tails off. Whoops! It does not do that. It just kind of goes off like this. You can forget that part. It doesn't go back up in the air. So this is your F distribution. It looks something like this, similar to a chi-squared distribution. In fact, it is related to it, but that's the distribution we're going to be using. And we're going to do the same thing as we did before for part of the analysis. We're going to choose an alpha related to the confidence level. And then we'll find a critical F value. Let me erase my shame here for a minute and try again. Um, okay. So... 
here will be the F distribution. Oh, I guess I like to make that little thing at the end. So we're going to leave that. Okay, so you're going to have an, you're choosing an alpha related to your confidence level that you've chosen. Okay, so based on this F distribution, the F distribution changes with both the number of treatments and the number of subjects. Okay, and I'll explain that in a minute. But so you have this, um, so you have an alpha. Again, this is a right tail test. So you find the critical value. So the critical value is going to be right here. So that your critical value is found. So that the area under the test, area from the critical value on, corresponds to alpha. Then you're going to take the data that you got from this design experiment with all these treatments and you're going to determine what's called the F test value. Now this seems very similar to what we've done before, it is. Okay, so the F test value, if the F test value is here, in other words, in the non-critical region, then you will accept the null hypothesis. If the test value is out here in the critical region, you will ex reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so that's the same thing we've done all along in hypothesis testing. Also, you can compute the p-value. The p-value is the area from the f-test value on out to the tail of this distribution. To recall the chi-squared distribution required um, that you specify the degrees of freedom and the degrees of freedom uh, for chi-squared distribution was the number uh, minus one. For the F distribution you need two degrees of freedom and the reason for that is the F di distribution is a ratio of two chi-squared distributions and each of those has their own degrees of freedom and that's why you need two of them. They're written in different ways. Sometimes they're written as uh, degrees of freedom for the numerator and degrees of freedom for the denominator. Here we'll write them as degrees of freedom for treatment, degrees of freedom for the errors, and P is going to be the number of treatments that we had. Right, that's the number of different treatments in the experiment, minus one. Okay. The other degrees of freedom is a total number of subjects minus the degrees of freedom. So if you have an experiment, let's say, involving 200 subjects and you uh, break them into, well, etc., 10 treatment groups, then P is 10, and this is not the P value. That's a uh, unfortunate choice of letters, but that's what um, I'm following Mendenhall so that you can follow this in the text. So the number of treatments is 10, the total number of subjects is 200, this first degree of freedom would be 9, the second degree of freedom would be 180. Okay. Now for this F test value, we'll do that one first. It is a ratio of two calculations called mean squares. The MST is the mean square for treatments and the MSE is the mean square for errors. These have different names depending on what book you're reading. The numerator can be called the between group variance. There's Now they're using the word variance. or and the um, denominator can be called the within group variance. So they're just different ways to look at it. And here's a calculation, and if you look at that calculation, it's not any different than what we've done before. You have the difference. Okay, let me explain the terms. Okay. And the denominator, you have these degrees of freedom for treatments, P minus 1. Okay, in the numerator, you take the weighted sum. It's weighted because the number in each 
treatment group. This is the number in the treatment group times the difference between the mean of that treatment group minus the mean for the whole experiment squared, and you sum it over p. Okay, so I mean, all the statistics actually just boils down to this. You take these means, and then you look at how far you are from the mean and square that distance. And that's just about the whole thing. Okay, so for the other one, you look at the variance for each group, and you weight it by n minus 1, it should be ni minus 1, and you divide by the other degrees of freedom, that n minus p. Okay, so again, this f is going to be the ratio of two mean squares that are calculated separately. I'm going to go through an example. It's from another statistics book that's mentioned um, in the syllabus here, this um, Blauman, uh, which is a very good straightforward book. And so we're just going to do this example by hand, although you aren't required to do one by hand in this class. So let's say um, in his example here, you have uh, a designed experiment with three treatments. And the goal of this um, experiment is to study a blood pressure reduction. How do these treatments reduce blood pressure? So you'll have three treatments. That means P, our variable P, is going to be three. And let's say there are five subjects in each group. So that's just what's written here. Okay. Right. Now we have a null hypothesis. A null hypothesis says that the mean change in blood pressure in each of these three treatment groups is the same. Mu1 equals mu2 equals mu3, and the alternative hypothesis says at least one of these is significantly different from the others. So that's the setup. So you have a design experiment, you have a certain number of subjects, you divide them into different treatments. I'm going to say this again, so just for emphasis, the null hypothesis is that all these treatments are going to give you the same results. That uh, the mean from each one of these treatment groups is going to be essentially the same. The alternative hypothesis is that, that at least one is going to be different. Now this might seem kind of contradictory. Why would you start doing all this work, getting all this money, doing all this work to do experiments when your basic idea behind behind it, your null hypothesis, is that there won't be any difference. But at any rate, that's how it's done. Of course, that's interesting information if all three treatments are um, give exactly the same results. So the null hypothesis does provide information also. So now here's the data. The treatments were some kind of medication, exercise, and diet, certain diet. And here are the five subjects, the results from the five subjects. And um, what we're seeing here are things that you'll need to do the analysis. You need the mean of each one of the treatment groups. Well, for the medication, the mean change was 11.8. I assume this is reduction and not increase. For the exercise group, the mean change was 3.8. For diet group, the mean change was 7.6. And along with that, we have the variance for each one of the treatment groups. Now we take something which doesn't seem to have much intuitive meaning, but this is our, we do this, okay? We find the mean for the entire group, for the, everybody. So you add up 10, 12, 9, 15, 13, 6, 8, blah, blah, I keep going through these, you add up all of the values for every single one of the treatments, regardless of where they're falling, you add them all up and divide by the total number of subjects. Of course, there's 15 subjects because there were five in three groups. Now we find that the, the overall mean is 7.73. So overall, for these three different treatments, we see a 7.73 decrease, I guess, in systolic blood pressure. So now we have to find an F test value and compare it with a critical F value. So 
we find the critical value in the typical way. We find an alpha. Let's set alpha equal to 0.05, which means our confidence level will be 95%. Then we have to calculate those two degrees of freedom. One of them was the total number of treatments minus one. There were three treatments, minus one gives you two. The other um, is the total number of subjects minus the treatment. So there are 15 subjects. Ooh, there's supposed to be a minus sign here. Let me just fix that for you right now. That's 15 minus three. Okay, total number of subjects was 15. Three different treatments minus three gives you 12. Then you can use software or you can use tables with those two values, the two and the 12, to find the critical F value for this alpha and its value is 3.89. Okay, so we'll use that later. Now we have to calculate that F test value. It's a little more complicated, but it's more tedious than difficult. Okay. Remember that F is the uh, ratio of two calculations. So here's the one for whoops, here's the one for the numerator. I have to take the number of subjects, okay, in the first treatment group it's five, and subtract the mean of the first treatment group from the overall mean. So it'd be eleven point eight minus seven point seven three and square it. To that I add the number of uh, subjects in the second group, which is also 5, and its mean minus the 7.73 for the overall mean and square it. And the same thing for the third treatment group. Then I divide by the number of treatment groups minus 1. There were 3 minus 1 gives me 2, and I find an 80.07 for the numerator. Now for the denominator, I have to just, I have to use the variances and multiply them by the number of subjects minus one. So it'd be five minus one here, here, and here. They're all the same. And here are those variances. Divide by the other degree of freedom. Total number minus the number of treatments. That would be 15 minus three. Give me 12. And I get in uh, the de uh, denominator of 8.73. Okay, calculate the F. The F is 9.17. The 9.17 is greater than the 3.86. It is in the critical region. Okay. So the null hypothesis is rejected. All right. If I would again try to sort of draw this. Okay. So here's my F distribution, and these F distribution curves act change depending on the degrees of freedom, of course. And I like to put little bumps at the end for no good reason. And so here's my 3.89 for the critical value. And way out here at 9.17, oops, how did that work, is the F test value. It's way out here in the critical region, and, and that's why, the, in this case, a null hypothesis is rejected. It's also possible to find the p-value, which we will do in the next um, video, and the p-value will be the area beyond this f-test value.